special to have you here, and uh, over to you. And that's the title. Yeah, well, it's, Genesis. it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm amazed you remembered all of that. Wow. Um, and uh, it's completely <laughs> unnecessary <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just uh, incredible. Um, I need to ask maybe two things. Is, I don't know whether it's. Is it possible to switch off a, yeah. a couple of the lights? And, <clears throat> Uh, yeah. So, uh, so thanks. It's really, really nice to be, uh, really nice to be here. Um, so, yeah. So, so, um, so I'm going to talk about um, Scrum Matter Genesis, and uh, I want to argue, as the title says, I want to argue that this is really, I think it's really an exemplar of um, adult stem cell regulation. Um, as uh, was mentioned, you know, I'm my background is in theory. This is not going to be a really theoretical talk. It's going to be a lot of data, a little bit of, little bit of um, analysis, but, but very simple. So maybe I should just uh, begin by just saying, you know, what we're all about as, as a lab, just a, a few phrases. So, yes, yeah, so I'm coming from physics. I now have uh, a mixed lab. We, have, we do some animal work. We have some theorists. Uh, and what, you know, our angle is, uh, like many people here, is that we try to bring concepts, ideas from statistical physics and emergent phenomena uh, to try to build minimal models uh, of biological systems. Uh, we have a number of different projects. Uh, we're very interested in the morphogenesis of epithelial tissue types, branching morphogenesis and so on. For a long time, we've been very interested in mechanisms of stem cell fate. Most of our experimental work is actually targeted at, at, at the phenomenon of natural injury-induced cellular reprogramming and how those programs are subverted in, in cancer. Uh, and I put this one in here. Actually, this is really an exciting topic for us, um, epigenetic inheritance and biological memory. And this, the reason I want to emphasize this, I, you know, I got excited about this area because I had a really superstar um, postdoc in my lab, Omar Karin, who's just joined the faculty at Imperial in the math department. Omar is amazing. I urge you to engage with him. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is mechanisms of stem cell fate. Okay, so, um, so what is a stem cell? Uh, well, in the context of adult tissue types, um, to, replenish, uh, uh, to replenish cells which are lost through wear, through exhaustion, through damage, uh, many cells, uh, many tissues undergo constant turnover through adult life. So you can think about uh, epithelial barrier function, uh, epithelial layers are typically constantly turned over, like the skin, intestinal epithelium. Uh, but you can think about the blood system. Uh, you can also think about parts of the brain that are constantly turned over. And this turnover relies on the activity of minority populations of renewing cells known as stem cells. And these are very special because they have the capacity both to duplicate, to renew, but also to give rise to more differentiated progenies. And I suppose you could say that one of the defining questions in stem cell biology is how do adult stem cells precisely regulate a perfect balance between duplication and differentiation to maintain homeostasis? How do they uh, achieve that balance? So that's a problem that we've been very interested in for a long time. And then the second question, which I'm not going to be discussing today, but it's very interesting in for our lab, is how do those programs become dysregulated in the transition to, to cancer? So this question about how you achieve a perfect balance, when I entered the stem cell field, uh, you know, 15 years ago, um, there was really a kind of folklore about the answer to this question. Tell me whether you think I'm right about this. And the folklore, you know, went like this. That many, not all, but many stem cell biologists uh, took the view, you know, assumed uh, that stem cells were characterized by fate asymmetry. Well, that has to be true at the population level, but the idea that each and every division should result in asymmetric fate outcome, one cell in the renewing compartment, one differentiating, that stem cells are defined by uh, a characteristic or a unique gene expression signature. So we tend to think about stem cell markers, after all. What is that ensemble of genes that specify the stem cell population, that these cells are positioned at the apex of a one-way differentiation hierarchy. It means that once you leave that compartment, you don't come back. Okay. And in addition, you know, further attributes 
uh, is that stem cells are maintained by tight physical contact to a discrete anatomical niche. That's the component that maintains stem cell renewal. That stem cells are often defined by long-term quiescence. In other words, they can exit cycle and enter into a quiescent or dormant state. So quiescence is a very, considered very much a characteristic of stem cell populations. And that when you look at injury or transplantation conditions, it's only really the stem cells that have that repopulation potential. Well, we now know that many of these things are not true. I think what's nice about the germline is I'm going to tell you that none of those things are true. Right? So all of these are things that I think people, uh, or attributes that people wanted to apply to stem cell populations, but in the case of the germline, we'll see none of these things are true. So the aim of the time I've got is to, is to show how spermatogenesis is really, I think, challenging a lot of the preconceptions that a lot of people have uh, about the nature of stem cell identity and, and function. Okay, so what we're going to do, quick, well, not that quick perhaps, uh, survey of spermatogenesis in mouse, anatomy, function, and so on. Uh, then I'm going to get to the challenge. What's the big question? What is the, what is the question we're really trying to answer here? And it is, how do stem cells renew in the context of an open niche? I'll explain what I mean by that at the time. We're then going to build uh, an experimental hypothesis. And actually, we're not going to do it. My collaborator did it very nicely, and I'm going to tell you his brilliant idea. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how we challenged his idea in the framework of a min minimal model. And then I'm going to try to see whether we can move that forward towards molecular mechanism. And I put in here towards because we don't have the answer. But we're on the way. And then. Forgive me, but this might be quite long, unless you stop me. Uh, we'll have a long discussion on perspectives and generalizations, because I want to try to sell you the idea that this is really a paradigm for stem cell regulation in other contexts. Okay, so, so we may spend a little time. What would be a respectable length of time to? Yeah, sort of 15 minutes or okay. more. Okay. Like, you know, perfect, 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 perfect. No, don't worry, I'll stick with that. OK. I, you know. I'm sure this is a mixed audience, and I, I, I thought it was <laughs> important to put this in, you know, for the physicists, mathematicians, right? Uh, it's always difficult to know where to put the balance in these kind of multidisciplinary talks. The balance I'm going for here is really to, to put the emphasis on the biology. We're not going to do a ton of maths, and we're certainly not going to visit any new mathematics. So if you come along for this, you can sneak out, you know, <laughs> it's not what we're going to do. Okay, so melogenesis. So uh, germ cell production in, uh, in male mouse uh, is maintained by stem cells. Uh, and those stem cells uh, lying, lie on the basement membrane of seminiferous tubules. Uh, and those cells are minority population. Uh, and they give rise, they're mitotic, and they give rise to mitotic progenies that also live on the basement membrane. So those mitotic cells go through something like 10 rounds of division before they enter into meiosis. And when they enter into meiosis, uh, they translocate um, across tight junctions between very large Sertoli cells, and they move through the adluminal compartments, and they mature, and eventually they're released as mature sperm. Okay? Now... What's slightly unusual about the germline system is that cell divisions are typically incomplete. Telophase is incomplete. And so the progenies share these interconnecting bridges, and so you generate chains of syncytia during this process. You'll see that in, in a second. In terms of markers, stem cells are enriched in the expression of GIRF alpha 1 GDMF receptor. And GIRF alpha one expression it, uh, it extends to A singles, A pairs. I hope the notation is clear. Uh, uh, a aligned fours and eights. It sort of extends into this compartment, but it's enriched in singles. And it kind of has a reciprocal expression with neurogenin 3 and other um, early differentiation factors. And commitment to differentiation is marked by upregulation of kit. So up upregulate up kit, you're gone. You're differ on a differentiation, differentiation path. And another feature of germ cells is that they actively migrate on the basement membrane. So, so here is going to be a little movie 
of GFP driven off neurogenin 3. This was generated by my collaborator, Shosei Yoshida. This is already quite old. Uh, and you'll see if the movie runs, here's an aligned 4, makes an aligned age. You can see it dancing across uh, the seminiferous tubules there. And uh, this, this is, by the way, I want to say, it's not my work, this is Shosei's work. This is a tour de force. This is intravital imaging that they could do over three days of, of continuous live imaging. You think, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, really very beautiful. Okay. Now, all stages of germ cell differentiation are coordinated by a periodic retinoic acid cycle. Uh, so in the mouse, that cycle is around 8.6 days. And that retinoic acid cycle does many things. A key thing it does is it transitions states which are neurogenin-3 high into KIT positive compartment. So it's regulating that transition from being undifferentiated into being on a differentiation path. It also regulates the transition into meiosis uh, and, uh, 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 and detachment from the basin membrane. And it also regulates the steps through this ad luminal compartment. So it's really the kind of pacemaker that is, that is coordinating all stages of germ line development. But this retinoic acid cycle is not synchronized across the tubules. And in fact, what it does is it moves as a phase wave along the tubule. We'll see that in a second. But, but so, you know, here retinoic acid concentration is high, and it's moving along the tubules like a, like a phase wave. I'm inclined to say Mexican wave in the stadium, right? So the, the people aren't moving, but you see the wave move. And actually, you can uh, see that uh, here. Um, th th this will be a, a, um, uh, a movie uh, which was generated by another collaborator, Toshiyuki uh, Sato, um, uh, where he's driving GFP from STRA8. STRA8 is expressed in synchrony with the peak of retinoic acid signal. And you'll see, again, this is intravital imaging, you'll see that wave uh, move here. There it goes uh, around, and it's on a loop. I mean, I've put the movie on a loop, but you can see it moving in this, uh, in this periodic fashion. And you might see here, actually, some really giant syncytia. You can see it here. And that's that huge syncytia entering into meiosis. And you can maybe see some slightly uh, more uh, faint, smaller syncytia. And those are the ones which are undergoing differentiation. So one of the projects we have in the lab, actually, is understanding the dynamics of this phase wave. It's another project. OK. So where does stem cell function reside? Is it? The A singles? Is it shared across a wider compartment? Where does that reside? Now, it turns out that this is quite an old question. You know, when we think about stem cell biology, people often think about Till and McCulloch and the amazing work that was done in that context. But this question was asked in this context uh, by Charles Philippe Le Blonde in 1953, okay. long time ago. And even at that time, uh, Le Blonde wrote that's the main feature of his hypothesis is maybe described as stem cell renewal theory, is the periodic appearance of a stem cell which segregates itself from spermatogonia, dividing to produce spermatocytes. So his idea was that there is an asingle population which divides asymmetrically. One daughter stays as a stem cell, and the other enters in irreversibly into the differentiation program. That was, that was his idea. I think of Le Blonde as really the a father of stem cell biology. He, he understood so many um, epithelial tissue stem cell dynamics. Um, so this then crystallized over the years into what became known as the AS model, with the idea that all stem cell potential is invested in A-singles that give rise to asymmetrical division into cells that produce A-pairs, uh, A-aligned fours and eights, and so on, and then periodically, with the retinoic acid cycle, those cells are transferred into a differentiated compartment that then expand and undergo meiosis. What could be simpler, right? This, what could be simpler? Okay. So the A singles comprise the self-renewing compartment, dividing asymmetrically. But is it true? Is this actually what's going on? We don't think so. Okay. 
So enter Shosei Yoshida. So Shosei has been a collaborator now for uh, 12, more than 12 years, and he's really amazing. He's actually in Cambridge next week, looking forward to the visit. Uh, and so I'll introduce, okay, intro, sort of setting context, how we got to the hypothesis we got to. So what Shosei did a couple of years ago, or actually um, his postdoc in Shirohara did, was first of all to label the Giraffe Alpha 1 positive population at high density. So he used his a genetic labeling system where you turn on a GFP, and in this case, at day zero, he's labeling around 20% of cells in the Giraffe Alpha 1 population. Remember I said that stem cells are enriched in that population? So if you look at what happens to this 20%, you start with around 20%, after one year, you've still got 20% of labeled cells. So that means that you've labeled the renewing population. It doesn't mean that all of the cells are renewing. All it means is that the renewing cells are somewhere in there. Okay. And the next thing is let's look at where Giraffe Alpha 1 is expressed. Well, if we, let's so say a unit is an A single or an A pair or a line four, let's call those units. So if we look at where Giraffe Alpha 1 expression is, 50 50% of units are A-singles, but actually 30% of Giraffe Alpha 1 expressing units are actually pairs and aligned fours and so on. So Giraffe Alpha 1 expression is extending through these uh, sin situa. So the next key thing is let's not look at this high level of labeling. Let's label individual cells. And now it kind of becomes interesting. So here, what Shosei's lab has done is labeled under Giraffe Alpha 1 at clonal density. So here you can see at day two, an A single, which is Giraffe Alpha 1 positive, GFP positive. And that's our, ones, that's our one cell clone. At day 14, you can see that a clone has now developed into two A pair units. So it's duplicated in terms of units, and it's duplicated as pairs. Here's another clone which has one A single and some sin situa here which have lost all Giraffe Alpha 1 expression. And here's another clone in which we have no Giraffe Alpha 1 expression anymore. And if we look at all of that, we can look at the distribution of clones at different times and we can see a very broad distribution. Right? So at day 20, some of the clones are comprised of 11 units. Many, many of the clones have no units at all. And remember, we know that this is flat. So as we lose units, others are growing. And if we put all of that together qualitatively, what that means is that we've got very variable fate. What we've got is what looks like stochastic duplication balanced by loss. Right? It looks like, as at the level of units, we duplicate, and we're in a perfectly balanced way, uh, cells differentiate. Okay. So, okay. so we've got activity in giraffe alpha one population. That population is heterogeneous in morphology. We've got highly variable fate. That's three. Four. These giraffe alpha one positive cells are highly motile on the basement membrane. You know, they almost look like they're little creatures running around. I mean, this movie is over uh, two days, and here are the tracks. Uh, the scale bar here is, is badly not written, but, you know, this is probably around 200 microns or so. So you have a sense they're actively migrating. And they look like they're on their own, but that's because we're just driving GFP off Giraffe Alpha 1. In fact, this is like Piccadilly Circus. It's absolutely crowded with all of their differentiating progenies. So that's another important point. And then finally, if we score the density of Giraffe Alpha 1 positive cells, it's roughly uniform. We don't have large density fluctuations. They've segregated themselves in a roughly uniform way. Okay. So here's the challenge. What is the molecular and morphological identity of the stem cell compartment? What's the expression signature? Is it just A-singles? Is it A-pairs? How far does it extend? 
But the most important thing here, and the most subtle thing here, is the following. How do you regulate the perfect balance bet locally between duplication and differentiation? These stem cells are separated from each other by long distances, four, five, six, ten cell diameters. But they locally coordinate duplication and loss. How do they do that? So this is the problem of stem cell regulation in open niche. An open niche is a niche where stem cells share that niche with their differentiating progenies. How do you balance uh, fate in that, on that background? So this is the challenge that we have. And this question, I'm going to tell you, is a completely general question. It applies to the bone marrow niche, for example. But it applies to epithelial tissue types. It's a very general question, for which I think we have some answers here. OK, so let's get some clues. So again, this is work that was done in Shosei Yoshida's lab. Uh, that's you, Kitadate. You was a postdoc in Shosei's lab. You did very beautiful work. So here's the clues. So the first thing that uh, you, Kitadate, did was to change the expression of FGF5. Now, there are multiple FGFs that play a role here. But he modulated expression of FGF5. This is the uh, wild type. He looked, here's FGF5 um, knockout. Here's adding an extra copy of FGF5 in the back transgenic. And what he found was the mice were completely happy, but they achieved a new steady state density that tracked the FGF allele fraction. So as you reduce FGF levels, the steady state stem cell density drops. And if you increase FGF levels, it increases. So where's the FGFs coming from? So FGFs are secreted by somatic cells, lymphatic endothelial cells that sit outside the basement membrane. And those FGFs diffuse through the basement membrane. They don't diffuse very far. They get across the basement membrane. And those FGFs are received and internalized by stem cells. They're consumed. So I'm not going to go through this, but this is the uh, machinery which is uh, taking in uh, FGF5 and then uh, degrading the uh, FGF protein. Okay. So what is FGF5 and other FGFs? What's it doing? Okay. So this led Chausey to uh, a really nice hypothesis. I want to put the emphasis on, 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 on Chausey here. So I'm going to convert this into a sort of toy bit of math. But the idea was really Chausey's. Uh, and he had this great idea. I called it, he didn't call it this, he had more sense. I'm going to call this stem cell ecology, right? So he had this great idea, which was the following. So what he proposed, so what do these stem cells have to do? They've got to figure out what their density is. But most of the cells around them aren't stem cells. So how are they going to work out what their density is? Well, the way they're going to do that is by quorum sensing. So his idea was the following. How do you work out what the local density is? Well, what you do is you just look at the concentration of FGFs. If the, FGF, if the stem cell density is low, the FGF concentration is high, and stem cells are inhibited from differentiation. But when it gets crowded, FGFs get depleted, and these cells switch into a new state in which differentiation licensing factors turn on. Now, these cells are not committed to differentiation, but they're able to hear the differentiation signal. So when they receive renoic acid, these cells can then transition into a committed state. But when they're in this state, if they recover access to FGFs, they move back. Okay. So this, this, is a, you know, this is a slightly radical idea, because what uh, he's really saying is that stem cell differentiation is really a two-stage process. The factors that control differentiation licensing are completely distinct from the f signals that drive commitment. And I make an analogy here. It's a bit like the manual transmission of a car, right? That, that the FGFs are controlling, they're like the clutch. If you have lots of FGFs, the clutch is depressed. And it doesn't matter what you do with the accelerator, the red nanic acid signal, the car won't move. But when you uh, deplete FGFs, 
You release the clutch, but the car won't move until it receives the red nanic acid signal. Okay. So that was, the, that was the idea. Is it correct? So, you know, in another world, I think we'd call this quorum sensing. It's basically quorum sensing. So what's the evidence for this? What's the evidence? Okay, so from this hypothesis, let's, let's build a little toy model. Um, and so David built a little toy model. So David was a postdoc in my group. Um, and, okay, so let's, let's make it very simple, right? Very simple. We've got stem cells, S. They divide, they duplicate, or they differentiate. They do that with some probability, and that probability is going to depend on FGF concentration, F. Right? So that probability, when the FGF concentration is very high, F is very big, then the probability at P is 1, it means they duplicate. When the FGF concentration is very low, P is roughly 0, they differentiate, and everything in between. And what about the FGFs? Well, the FGFs, let's say they're produced at some constant rate from the endothelial cells. They have some degradation rate. And they're consumed by the stem cells. Right? Put a little hill function here to, because we'll get some saturation. So what does that dynamics look like? Well, if we have a high enough production rate, then there are two fixed points, but this fixed point is steady state. We have a stable fixed point where we've got a constant stem cell density. And if we start anywhere around there, we will flow to that stable fixed point. Right? So what would, this is a toy model. What would be a prediction of that model? Well, it's very easy to show, I mean, you can almost do it in your head, that this predicts that the stem cell density should scale linearly with the synthesis rate. There it is. Right, the steady state density should scale linearly with the synthesis rate. So let's have a look. Well, you know, this is a bit naive. Uh, what we can do is we can change the allele fraction of FGFs. It's a bit naive to assume that the protein concentration would perfectly track that, but hell, let's just wing it and have a look. So you can only imagine how much work is involved in, lab work is involved in this. So Chausset's lab looked at huge numbers of permutations of different mice with different allele fractions of FGFs. Right? So this is the wall type, and here FGF5, FGF8, FGF4, looking at different uh, allele fractions. And actually, the steady state density pretty much linearly tracks with the allele fraction. Right? So tick. Okay. Notice it doesn't go to zero. All right, that's okay. It's not, I don't think it's particularly compelling. But the thing that I think is more compelling is the following. If we look at what happens under perturbation, what happens if we would deplete stem cell number and ask how the system would recover? So we've got here a little phase diagram for this model. This is the synthesis rate. This is the degradation rate. Over here, we don't have uh, homeostasis. If we're in this region, if we kick the system away from steady state and release it, it gets back to steady state, and it does it in a monotonic way. But if we're in this region, and you kick the system, it gets back to steady state, but it gets back in an oscillatory way. And the way you, know, you can think about that in the following way. Let's say you, you knock out 95% of the stem cells. Now you've got tons of FGF. So now they just duplicate and duplicate, and they expand but they overshoot, and now there's a crisis, and there's not enough FGFs, and so they collapse. And then it, so it continues. So here's a little stochastic simulation. Um, the little white dots here are the stem cells. There's the, they have the crisis, now they depleted, and now they grow again, and so on. You get this characteristic ringing in this feedback type model. So do we see this? this Nonlinear response is really a hallmark of feedback. So Chausset's lab depleted, or you get it out, depleted the uh, um, stem cell concentration using busulfan uh, and looked at the recovery. And here it is. The dark blue here is the wild type. The lighter blue is FGF5 knockout. And you can see this beautifully ringing response. 
And the time scales here, you know, they're on the scale of, you know, I don't know, the period here is about 20, 30 days. It's much longer than the seminiferous cycle time. So this is not the seminiferous cycle. This is the oscillatory recovery, which is the hallmark of this kind of quorum sensing uh, dynamic. And then the final thing, and this actually goes back to work with um, uh, my student Alan Klein now 12 years ago, um, is what would you expect at the level of the clonal dynamics? Well, if we think about the stem cells, they're being locally lost and replaced. Okay. But eventually, when a clone expands around the tubule, from then on, it's only the boundary of the clone that's going to expand. It'll either expand or it'll contract or be lost. So if we do the math, it's actually like a one-dimensional annihilating random walk. You've got the clone, it does a random walk, but if it's lost, it's lost forever. So Alon, you know, is not a difficult problem to solve. Anyway, Alon solved that problem. Uh, and what you predict is that over time, the average clone size should grow as a square root of time, and the size distribution of the clones should fall onto this scaling-like curve, the chance of finding a clone larger than some multiple. The average should become constant. And what does the data do? It agrees very well with that. So, yeah, so this scaling curve, it has, it's a no-parameter fit, right? If we measure the clone length normalized by the average length, then it falls exactly onto this um, scaling curve. So, what's the summary? Okay, uh, so far. So stem cell dynamics in the germline is consistent with what I'm calling dynamic heterogeneity, with cells which switch in response to FGF concentration reversibly between states which are biased for renewal and states which are licensed but not committed to differentiation, becoming only committed in response to a secondary retinoic acid signal. What is the molecular morphological identity of the stem cell form? Just, just a quick yeah. It's interesting because you came up with this very simple model in Morphology Imagine. Okay, when you start with a very simple model, but in reality, things are more complicated. But the fact that you found these uh, damp and over damp uh, behaviors in the different regions of phase space, I mean, that's basically said, hey, I mean, it doesn't have to be more complicated, otherwise, you get you know, a nice oscillator or something like that. It, it has to be essentially a uh, one node oscillator with a bit of. No, that's true. So, so if the, at this stage, the, 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 well, the really take-home points at this stage are really these two things that basically, A, the way you regulate stem cell renewal in this context is through quorum sensing, and B, and this is a big prediction, is that the stem cell population is heterogeneous, but it's heterogeneous in a defined way where you segregate licensing from the factors that regulate commitment. But yes, you're, 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 I mean, um, there, there are multiple mechanisms that would converge onto that long-term dynamic. That's true. And, and, and actually, that's, of course, why we're wanting to ask this question. What are the molecular programs that regulate uh, that? Of course, the unfortunate news is I'm not going to give you... Right, but you'll... Okay. Let's see. But this is already worth challenging. Okay, so, so like the whole rest of the world, uh, when you're stuck for a good idea, you can always turn to single-cell RNA-seq. Okay. So, so this is, we're now getting more up-to-date now. So this is work, so uh, Toshinori, uh, who began this work, he's not doing this work now. He, Toshinori is a postdoc in Shosei Yoshida. Like, he's an amazingly good scientist, really a superstar. But he quit science recently to go and run uh, his father's sushi. I know, yeah, so, <laughs> right. So I'm really looking forward to visiting next time. It's gonna be great. And Sung Min is a, Min is a postdoc of mine, uh, and uh, he's a biophematician. Actually, he's a mathematician and biophematician. So the experimental data he generated by Toshinori and Sung Min did the analysis. So, so here what we've got is a UMAP of um, the undifferentiated population. This is basically the kit-negative population. 
Uh, you can see here that the UMAP has identified six clusters. Here are some core genes. The thing to focus on, and maybe it's flip, flip to the next slide, the thing to focus on is that within the Giraffe Alpha 1 population, we can identify three broad groups. Okay? Um, there they are. Right? So we've got a population which is Giraffe Alpha 1 high, and it's PLVAP high. We've got another population here, which is Giraffe Alpha 1 on. It's not so high, but it's high in SOX3, the so transcription factor SOX3. This has no SOX3 expression. I'm going to group together these two states. In a, uh, okay. And then we've got states here, which are neurogenin 3 high. So, so this looks like the differentiation trajectory. This is bias for renewal, allegedly. This is on the path to differentiation. And that links together, the, for those that know it, this is a PAGA gra graph-based abstraction for, for people who, who like those things. So if we now ask, you know, use uh, pseudotime to try to see what a trajectory might look on this background, it looked very cool, right? Because pseudotime, without any curation, pseudotime identifies a bifurcation. And this trajectory looks like we're just leaving this population and heading towards differentiation. But there's another trajectory which comes out that looks like this. And what this looks like is that it's suggestive that we have reversion between a PLVAP high population and a differentiation primed but not committed population that occurs between two distinct transcriptional states. In other words, it looks the, like the way you enter into a prime state is distinct from the way you leave a prime state and get back to a renewing state, which is kind of cool, right? We didn't, you know, that's kind of what we had inferred from looking at this toy model, but actually the single cell is, is pointing at this. This also correlates with, with syncytial composition. So if we look at cells belonging to this cluster, with PLVAP high, SOX3 negative, they are mostly tilted towards a single little bit of a pair. If we look at cells that belong to this primed group, PLVAP negative, SOX3 high, Giraffe alpha 1 intermediate, they extend more broadly. Into, into this group. That's consistent too. But if we really want to see whether this population is really able to contribute long-term to renewal, really want to see that they go back, then we have to do lineage tracing. Do they have renewal potential? And then we have to do lineage tracing. And so what we can do is, is here's an induction under PLBAT, SOX3 and neurogenin 3 in a three-month chase. And you can ask, how many colonies do I keep? And what you can see is that if you're peeled up high, some 20% of the colonies or clones are still surviving at three months. SOX3, you're down to just 2%, but you're not down to no percent, right? This is reversion. And neurogenin 3, you're now off scale. Okay? So this is a demonstration that this population is able to get back and contribute long-term to the renewing pool. And again, just for the experts, if we look at the, how gene expression changes have occurred along those trajectories, the differentiation trajectory and reversion trajectory, and we're digging into all of this, uh, but the, the things that really crop up, the things that are highlight there, uh, are differential changes in chromatin modifiers, uh, SMARCA4, SMARCA5, and also components of the NERD complex, CHD4, CHD5, which also appears in reversion in ES cells and also changes in methylation. It's not a mechanism, but it, we're beginning to unpick what are the molecular programs that mediate this reversible transition. Okay. So, again, summary. Okay. So, combination of intravital imaging, clonal dynamic, and all of that, it points to this kind of feedback mechanism, quorum sensing-like mechanism uh, of stem cell competition. RNA-seq analysis suggests that this reversible transition occurs between discrete transcriptional states. We want to understand what those states uh, might be. I didn't stress it, but it's an interesting point that the division rate of these PLVAP high cells is precisely synchronous with the seminiferous cycle. And when I say it's synchronous, what I mean by that 
is it that these cells divide exactly once per cycle, like a metronome. Very interesting. Why would they do that? Exactly once per cycle. But when they get to this state, the cell division rate is two, three times higher and is now more asynchronous. Okay. Perspectives. Right, so I've got a few minutes, right? Perspectives. Okay, so all of this should really remind you of quorum sensing and, and, and bacterial populations, ecological settings, and so on. It's actually very much like Malthusian theory, you know, his, his, his controversial idea way back when was that populations expand and expand until you meet the carrying capacity of the resource, and then there's war and fighting, and you remain at this steady state. Um, and Chausset had a much more poetic way of, of looking at this, and that one I actually prefer much more. So when, you know, he, he doesn't like any math, very sensibly. So he has this nice idea that, you know, how many cows can you keep happily in a field? It's not the number that you can physically pack in the field, but it's regulated by grass production. More grass production, more cows. Less grass production, less cows. And what's really key is you leave the cows alone and they'll work it out, right? They'll work it out in this Malthusian way. And that also gives you the idea that this mechanism of regulation, mechanism in the physics-y sense, is robust to spatial heterogeneity. You don't have to regulate that. It'll work it out or temporal changes. It's very robust. It'll return to that. And of course, this idea is not particularly new. I mean, it's not new in the context of bacterial populations, for sure. But it's also not new in, in you know, eukaryotic cells. Beautiful work done by Uri Alon and collaborators uh, where they uh, elucidated how you achieve a balance between uh, uh, complementary populations, in this case, fibroblasts and macrophages, where you have a reciprocal feedback mechanism so this is absolutely analogous to what we have. The difference between this and what we have is for us, um, uh, 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 for us, we don't have you know, two components of the system. We just have one component that's feeding on FGFs. The lymphatic endothelial cells are just producing FGFs. They don't do anything else. Whereas here, both of these cell types are responding to factors that are secreted by the other. But again, it's how you achieve a very stable balance. And in fact, if you link this uh, to mobility of these cells, it's very easy to generate patterning phenomena and so on. This also exposes a vulnerability. Uh, if we have a mutation, an activating mutation in FGF receptors, then those cells are now advantaged. Uh, and in fact, actually, this has been picked up years ago uh, by um, Anne Dorley and uh, Wilkie's lab in Oxford, for example, uh, where they've been very interested in looking at de novo gain of function mutations in FGF. This is a section through the testes of, of humans, and you see these giant clonal patches, or presumably they're clonal, with activating mutations in FGFR2 and 3. Uh, and they have this concept of selfish selection that these point mutations are associated with certain congenital diseases. So, for example, APERT syndrome, which is associated with a point mutation in FGFR2, the incidence of APERT syndrome in aging fathers increases rapidly, and they think that that's linked to this advantage that the cells have in this context. So one of the core cool things that Chausset's lab did, someone in his lab is very interested in the problem of animal conservation, I was really involved in that, uh, and wants to try to find ways to increase transplantation efficiency uh, of, uh, of germline stem cells. And so one way to do that is to block retinoic acid signaling so you still keep stem cell cell renewal, but cells are blocked from differentiating. And by doing that, you can massively increase the, the transplantation efficiency of stem cells to levels that restore fertility in mice. Okay. So we started with this folklore, right? So individual long-lived, unique gene expression, one-way hierarchy, all of these things, right? None of them are true for the germline, apparently. In fact, stem cells are not long-lived, but they're stochastically lost and replaced within an open niche, not a discrete anatomical niche. They're heterogeneous, transitioning reversibly between states biased for renewal and prime for differentiation. You can think of this as flexibility. And I didn't show you this, but I wanted to add it to the list. I didn't show you this, 
that like so many epithelial tissues, cells which are normally committed to differentiation are able to reprogram in response to injury, or in this case transplantation, and reacquire stem cell retention. So they really, you know, all of these things that we thought we knew, they're all very different. You have flexibility and plasticity. How generic is an open niche? I'm almost done. How generic is an open niche? Well, honestly, I think it's completely generic. Here, for example, is the trachea. In the trachea, stem cell function uh, is invested in uh, these little pyramidal-like basal cells that anchor to the basal, basal membrane, and those cells give rise to the secretory cells, the club cells, and ciliated cells. Right? But those cells are typically far separated from their neighbors. But this is a system where you have exactly that kind of stochastic loss and locally balanced stochastic loss and replacement. And my hypothesis, let's call it a guess, maybe this is too grand, is that alongside cell state plasticity, which we see in epithelial tissues, this kind of flexibility, this kind of quorum sensing mechanism, this is how you regulate stable stem cell density homeostasis in all of these kinds of tissue types. What about human? Human's funny. So human has this Jura Farrell 1 population and this kit population. But strangely, the apex is not Jura, Jura Farrell 1 high. So it looks like mouse is somewhere here, and the mouse lacks this population. And a lot of people, including me, think that these cells function as a reserve population, a quiescent population, which is protecting the integrity of the, of the, of the genome, and gradually drip feed cells into this compartment. So in a mouse, you probably don't have to worry too much about the acquisition of uh, you know, sporadic mutations through division, because the fertility time span is not that great. But in a human, it becomes um, an issue. OK, and so I just flash this um, with Athena. Um, other examples? Well, I think the bone marrow niche is just such an example. Stem cells and progenitors actively migrating in the bone marrow niche. Uh, and let me just show you here. You deplete the stem cell population uh, and progenitor population, and you see exactly this kind of rebound, this kind of nonlinear recovery, which I think is the, just that first sign of that kind of uh, feedback dynamic. OK, so I'm done. Um, I'm done. Uh, I, I probably mentioned everybody as I, as I went through, um, so I'm not going to go through them again. They're my collaborators. I'm so happy with them. They're fantastic. And just this little plug here, uh, we're currently recruiting both on experimental and also uh, theoretical side. so please think of us. OK, I'm done. Thank you. On, on sorry, which cells? On stem cells, so they're epithelial stem cells and scales. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we don't think they have a niche. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see this sort of oscillatory pattern. Um, yeah. As FGS, because the, the stuff that we look at in in uh, scalings yeah. also has an oscillatory pattern of the core. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks for this question, which I, I, I think is a really, I'll tell you why I'm really, I really like this question. I'll, 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 I'll comment in the following way. So in our lab, one of the things that we're very interested in is the um, stem cell maintenance in the skin or esophagus epithelium, it's the squamous tissue. Uh, and of course there, I also think you can imagine, I also think it's quorum sensing, you've got basal stem cells, you've got progenitors in that population, they have the sense. So I also think it's, you know, it's, it, uh, they're competing for niche factors. Now, of course, you might think, I might think, that those niche factors are associated with secreted factors from uh, fibroblasts, you know, EGF and, and so on. 
fact of the matter is that you can culture those cells fabulously well for months and months and even years if you treat them nicely and they grow beautifully as stratified epithelia without any of those dermal components. Okay. What do I think is, is going on? You know, it doesn't just have to be extrinsic factors that contribute as the niche factors that maintain renewal. It can also be autocrine signals from the cells themselves, right? It's, you know, they can create their own niche environment, both through, you know, secreting factors that contribute to ECM and so on, or directly, you know, secreting autocrine factors. So my guess in your case is just that, that they, the cells themselves, are providing their own niche and are secreting factors. This is how he's an expert on this. This is how quorum sensing is working in bacterial populations, right? There isn't a niche. They communicate with each other through, uh, through secretion. I think if you see that kind of oscillatory dynamic, that's really a hallmark of that kind of feedback. About which I know nothing, by the way. <laughs> About which I know nothing, by the way, but, but have a go. <laughs> You mean in the um, you mean in the human with this additional compartment? Or? Well, I meant, I meant the, the, the reversion. So so um, based on uh, long term tracing from PLVAP, which is one, targeting one population, SOX three targeting another population, uh, the re, the long term repopulation probability is maybe a factor of 10 different, factor of 10 different, okay? It's like 20%, 2% in over three months. So one way of looking at that is to say, well, that's not very, 2% is not very much. Right. It, the point here is, is more, I think, related to the mechanism by which those cells are able to regulate homeostasis by having to transition through a prime state, uncommitted state, ahead of commitment. It's really, you know, the, the mechanistic point is that one. And it's not so much how often do you get to undergo reversion, right? It's, uh, right, so, yeah, if you ask the quantitative question, it's probably a factor of 10, right, difference. But I think it's not the number that's the key thing. It's the fact that it happens at all, which is really the fundamental thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. But you see, that's, that, I think that's really a key. Thanks for asking this. It's really a key point. Um, if you look at the 2% that go back, that wasn't because the 2% were really special. You go in there, find those 2%, they have this particular signature. It's rather about their life chances, right? So those cells are equipotent. But because that one happened to move and find uh, FGF source, or GDNF actually is another factor contributing here, it's able to transition back. So it's not heterogeneity in that sense, right? It's, it's, it's the chance fate outcome of an equipotent group. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, so th thanks for uh, this. This is such a cool question, okay? So, obviously, I present here the simplest possible, okay, right. Now, the fact of the matter is that the differentiating progenies are also uh, uptaking FGFs. It makes the math a bit more difficult. It doesn't change the mechanism. 
And the other thing that we assume is that those lymphatic endothelial cells are completely stupid and just pumping out uh, FGFs at some constant rate. That is almost certainly not the case. There's almost certainly crosstalk, so that changes, reciprocal signaling is probably modulating that. These are all refinements that we can make in the math, but it's beyond the resolution of the experiment. So we don't want to do it. But yeah, so the, all these things are exactly correct. It's almost certain that the differentiated cells are contributing to providing the renewal factors. It's a bit like your question, right? That you have uh, paracline, paracline, autocline signaling from the epithelial populations themselves. Moving over to Chifan for your physics question. Oh, no, 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 very quick question. So you've identified FGF5 as the graph for your stem cells. How do you virtual this FGF5? Yeah, no, and that's a great question. So first of all, it's multiple FGFs. The other thing I showed was that if, if, you, if you knock out all, of, you know, all three FGFs, we still don't go down to zero. We know that GDNF is also playing a key role as a fate determinant. Um, we, we think... You know, it's a question whether that's acting in parallel or in, in, in series, and we're trying to disentangle that uh, right now. Uh, it comes back again to your question. I think these systems are massively overspecified in the sense that there are multiple factors that are contributing to, main, you know, to main, uh, affecting that switch. So uh, as it is, I think FGFs as a niche factor is very common. If you look at what, remain, what maintains renewal activity in the tips of growing lung buds, it's FGFs, right? Probably it's a very similar kind of mechanism. But in the context of skin, it's more likely that EGF is playing the key role in that context. So I think the mechanism is concerned, but the molecules will be different depending on the context. I'm not an expert on quorum sensing, but I was on the same floor as Kwame Patsa. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, this open um, dental niche is a very interesting um, concept to me um, because we, I, I'm mainly working on the open stem cells, but yeah. I don't really get tips in the uh, tissue specific stem cells. So, because before we know, not really talking about the stem cell niche, Yeah. Yes, slightly yeah. different from yeah. the two blue, you know, the from sure. the that you mentioned. Yeah. Because they have this type of strip. No, that's right. You know, from the script yeah. to the progenitor and due to yeah. the and um, mature cells. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a great question. So, first of all, my lab is, is really around, in, uh, you know, intestinal. Uh, you know, that, that's what the, the lab is, is really focused on, or the main part of the focus. Yeah, you're right. So it's organized in the crypt. And actually, the crypt has become, as you know, has become the kind of, you know, poster child of a localized niche. The idea is that you've got uh, wind secreting factors at the base of the crypt, and that's what maintains self renewal. And that once you leave access to these, uh, you know, these. Uh, secretory cells, pan -S cells in the small intestine, that you enter irreversibly into a differentiation pathway. Yes, that's the classical view. I think it's wrong. I think it's another example of an open niche. Uh, what we know from recent work that we did with Jakob van Rienen is that we can see that cells near the uh, border of the niche of the, in the small intestine undergo active retrograde flow and move back into the base of the niche. So we know that there's heterogeneity. The fate of cells at the base of the niche is different to the short-term bias at the edge of the niche, but we know through cell rearrangements that whole population functions as an equipotent population. And I think that it belongs precisely to this uh, open niche paradigm. But proving it in that context, that of course is more difficult because of the geometry. But if you ask me, you know, as, as a hypothesis, I think it's the same. Yeah, I think it's the same. Because this is robust, right?
about a quote about Krishna and said, so we're thinking also about the open niche versus the, in, in, in conjunction with the quorum sensing idea, yeah? I mean, the quorum sensing idea seems to be working quite well in sort of uh, ecological systems which have co-evolved, you know, thinking of the beauty of Harvey, I think, in, in, in the live organ of the split, I think. Yeah. You know, you showed the cows in the ladder yeah. and so on. You know, things are sort of co-evolving that can work quite well. But once you put cows in some completely different, you know, scenario or, you know, say, bacteria in a different scenario, it, does, it might not work so well just because, you know, there's maybe depletion or dilution or that kind of stuff. In an open niche, don't you have the problem of, of dilution that things are not representing the actual quorum because of other effects? Things are diffusing away or being degraded? Or the, there is... Um, the, the, uh, the, what can I say about this? You know, w w one of the... If you take the germline example, you can ask, are uh, FGFs uh, diffusing significantly? And the answer is no, they hardly diffuse at all. What's key in the germline example is that the cells themselves are diffusing. They're migrating. Now, if you want to apply this idea, which I do, to an epithelial context like the skin, their cells don't move around very much. I mean, you know, the jargon is people will say it's a bit glassy, right? They really don't rearrange very much. So for this quorum sensing type of idea to work, there you do need to have some kind of uh, diffusion of the molecules that are mediating that signal. Um, now, does that make it fragile? Um, you know, I never, honestly, I never really thought about the robustness of that. I suppose empirically we don't see that, but um, yeah, I'm not sure what to, it's a good point. No, uh, in the germline, no. These cells just wander around the circumference of the, uh, of the basement membrane of the seminiferous tubule. They've got a slight tendency to prefer the vasculature, marginal, uh, but they just freely diffuse. Well, no, no, you should think of the tubule as being relatively uniform. It, it's, like, it's, like, um, it's like a flat isotropic surface that you fold up into a cylinder. So you, the only way they can leave is by moving into the, the luminal compartment. But there are tight junctions that inhibit that, except when they're entering to meiosis, and then they translocate through the tight junctions. So they're really confined, and, and the undifferentiated cells are really confined. They really tightly anchor to the basement membrane. Yeah, so I think they don't really know very much about passive. If you use the intestine of the yeah. brain, you know, so yeah. what sort of, at what sort of stage the cells are coming up from the open niche? Well, you see, the reason that's a very complicated question to ask is because the intestine is fabulously flexible which means that even cells which are outside the niche and on a differentiation path, as you may know, if you ablate stem cells chemically, you know, DTR, LGR5, DT, get rid of those stem cells, those differentiated cells readily go back. Right? So if you want to ask the question, what was the irreversible point of commitment? I don't know. Right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You probably then have to get under the hood, right? Then you need to be asking questions about what are the epigenetic changes which really enforce commitment and, and you know and that's where we are those that's the really deep question what does commitment really mean what is the signature of irreversible commitment in a normal situ normal context is there a question by someone else who has another question here first of all um, this is with respect to the differences in the regulation uh, between humans and mice where humans have the quiescent pool and mice have this uh, Stuff. Yeah, I wanted to know, was there any work done on like, trying to correlate these two different organizations genomically, or like the presence absence? Yeah, no, that's, that's a that great, wonderful question. Uh, 
Anne Gorley in Oxford, we have a collaborative grant with Anne and uh, Chausse. Uh, and Stephen Bush is an uh, uh, absolutely brilliant bioinformatician. Stephen is doing exactly that now, uh, integrating mouse and human and asking just how different, just how similar are they. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm going to say something very mean. They have some very exciting findings, but it would be irresponsible, I think, for me to say what that is. We should let Stephen say what that is. Uh, but suffice to say, I think that the mouse uh, is a like a subcompartment of human. So it's not like. So it's a derivative of the human organization. Yeah. And capable. Yeah, you can embed the mouse within that uh, that human picture. If I would make an analogy, I could also say, you know, if you think about blood, HSCs and, and multiprotein progenitors. Honestly, I'm not an expert, but the fact of the matter is that in a mouse almost all renewal is undertaken by the multipotent progenitors. And you wonder if you took the stem cells away altogether, would the mouse really collapse? Probably not. Right? So then you can ask, you know, what are HSCs good for? And you know there can be many reasons for that, protecting genome integrity, drip feeding this population, maybe being there for response to particular kinds of stress. So I think that that's the situation that prevails in uh, the germline, the mice have only MPPs and humans have, you know, quote unquote, HSCs and MPPs. Right. Um, this is worms again, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which, 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 which might be unusual, but very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I just thought, like, there was no point no, no. about that concept. Not, not really. You see, um, I suppose my, my, my comment about that, I think, is that you know what, what we're seeing here, of course, is cell competition, and cell competition in, implies that all of the cells are equipotent and have renewal potential. What they do once they enter into commitment. That can be highly programmed, highly deterministic formula unfolding a transcriptional program. But before that point, they have to be equipotent and flexible, almost by fiat, right? Because we think it's homeostasis. There's loss replacement. There's no other option. So, so I don't know. <laughs> this is, is the short answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again. I think it's time to conclude. And thank you so much. Thank you.